So let me ask you guys a question this morning. How many of you remember Paul Harvey? If you remember Paul Harvey, what was his famous line that Paul Harvey would say all the time? And now you know the rest of the story. Well, this morning, we're going to be in Numbers chapter uh, 14, or chapters 13 and 14, and um, we are going to look at verse 1 to start out with, because this is one of those verses where we're going to find out the rest of the story. Chapter 13 and verse 1, it says this, it says, the Lord spake to Moses, send men to scout the land of Canaan. I am giving it to the Israelites. Now, if we just read that verse, we would say, well, God sent the spies into the promised land to spy out the land. But I want to tell you the rest of the story. If you have your Bible, I want you to look in Deuteronomy chapter uh, 1 and verse 22. And here's what Moses says about this. He says, then all of you approached me and said, let's send men ahead of us so that they may experience the land for us and bring back a report about the route. We should go up to the cities we will come to. The plan seemed good to me, so I selected 12 men from among you, one from each tribe. So here's what kind of the rest of the story is. So here's Moses. And all the people are coming to him and they're saying, Moses, we got to send spies out because we're not sure we can take this land. Go ahead and send some spies out. And Moses is a reasonable guy. He says, well, that makes sense to me. We'll send some spies out. So he picked the 12 spies and then he called out to God and said, God, can I send these spies out? And it's, it's kind of like this to me. It reads like this. All right, Moses, if you don't want to trust me, go ahead and send the 12 spies out. Because that's kind of the rest of the story. This, Moses, I don't think God wanted... God already told them, this land is yours. Go take it. And we're going to read this morning what happened. It seems that people came to Moses. They wanted to send spies. Moses then went up to God and said, God, uh, can I send out the spies? And they did. So I want to pick up here in, uh, in chapter 13, verses 1, uh, verses 1 through um, 15 is, is Moses is picking the spies. Um, two of the spies that we know are Joshua and Caleb, but there's a bunch of other spies that we don't know. And, uh, and Joshua is kind of interesting because he didn't have any parents. He says right here, he was the son of none. Come on, that was pretty good. <laughs> Tara, was that you? <laughs> But I want to pick up in uh, I want to pick up in verse 14 or uh, I'm sorry, verse 16. And I don't have my glasses, so let's put verse 16 through uh, through 25 up on the screen. It says these were the names of the men who Moses. Uh, go ahead and jump to uh, what verse is that one? Is that verse 16? OK, it says these were the names of the men who Moses sent to spy out the land and Moses called Hoshea, the son of Nun, Joshua. Moses, let me just stop right there for a second. Moses changed Joshua's name. His name was Hoshea. It means salvation. And he changed his name to Joshua, which is Yahweh is my salvation. It's interesting that Jesus' name was the same name. Jesus is salvation. But Moses gave him that name right here in this passage. But it says, Moses sent them out to spy the land of Canaan and said to them, go up into the, ne uh, into the Negev and go up into the hill country and see what the land is and whether the people who dwell in it are strong or weak, whether they're few or many. Did any of that matter? And whether the land that they dwelled in is good or bad and whether the cities that dwell in the camps or strongholds and whether the land is rich or poor and whether there are trees in it or not. Be of good courage and bring some of the fruit of the land. Now the, uh, the time was the season of the first ripe grapes. So they went up and spied out the land from the wilderness of Zin to uh, Rehob near Lebo Hamath. And they went up into the Negev and came to Hebron, Ashima, uh, Shishai, all these other names, the descendants of Anak. They were there. Hebron was built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. Now, let me just stop there a second. I'm going to give you 
the, the, I'll tell you, Numbers is one of those books you can chase a bunch of rabbits. But that land, Zoab, the, there are writers that say Moses didn't write, didn't write the, um, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. But this is one of the, that Zoab is proof that it had to be Moses. Because Zoab was a place that only the Egyptian royalty would know. Well, guess where Moses lived his whole life? In the palace in Egypt. And so this is one of the proofs that, uh, that Moses was the author because no one else would have known about it. It was kind of a, a, high, a getaway for the Egyptian royalty. But it says, And they came to the valley of Eshol and cut down from there a branch with a single cluster of grapes. They carried it on a pole between the two of them. them those must have been some big old grapes. Like bowling ball sized grapes or something. I mean, I've never seen grapes that big, but it was a lot of grapes or big grapes. And they carried it on a pole between the two of them. They also brought some pomegranates and figs. Now, um, that place was called the Valley of Eshol because of the cluster that the people of Israel cut down from there. And the end of 40 days, they returned from spying out the land. Let's pray. Father, we come before you today, and I pray, Lord, as we look at this promised land that you had promised to Israel. And God, we, we're going to look at some of their sin, Lord, and some of their fears and their anxieties and all this stuff that come into our lives. And God, I pray that today that we will see, Lord, that we need to look at things with eyes of faith and not with eyes of fear. And Lord, I pray that today that you will speak to our hearts, Lord, and that we will know that you are God. And God, that we will we will be able to look with eyes of faith and see what you can do. And so, Lord, I pray that you'll bless this message. Lord, bless your word. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. First thing I want us to see is that we need to see our, our future through eyes of faith and not fear. So I want to start with the fear because, and, and I encourage you to go back and read all of chapter 13 and all of chapter 14 because we're not going to have time to go through all of it today. But I want to get this story out because here's the story. These people, these spies went into the land, they come back from the promised land, and they look at, they saw everything that was in there. They're carrying these grapes, two men to carry one cluster of grapes from the promised land back to Israel, or back to uh, Moses, and so they could see this stuff. They carried all this fig, and they said, indeed, this land is plentiful. Indeed, it's wonderful. It's, it's so fruitful. And I want to tell you something. We went to Israel, and we were down, in, we were down where they were, out in the middle of the desert, and we drove into, uh, we drove into um, Jerusalem, or, and into, um, where was the first place we went? Near the um, Sea of Galilee. And you drive from, from that desert into the Sea of Galilee, and you are in the most drastic desert you've ever seen in your life. And you come out of that desert, and you go by the Sea of Galilee, and I want to tell you there is... It is lush and it is green and there are orchards everywhere with trees everywhere and there's grapes everywhere and flowers everywhere. They produce, do you know that little tiny Israel produces most of the fruit that's eaten in Europe? And most of the flowers that are um, bought in Europe come from little tiny Israel. Why? Because it's the land that's flown with milk and honey. But I want you to understand that these guys, they went into this promised land that God told them that, that, they, that was theirs. Now think about where they've been. They, they came over in less than a year, or in a year, they came over, the Israelite, or the Egyptians were coming behind them, they were stuck, there, there's that, remember we showed the, the picture of the mountain range that they came through, it was the, these two cliffs on both sides, they come to the water, they're at the, at the uh, Red Sea, and the water's there, and the Egyptian army's coming through those mountains right to them, going to destroy them, and God parts the water. Parts of the Red Sea. They walk across the Red Sea, through the Red Sea on dry land, and they see, they turn around to look as the water collapses on all the Egyptian army and all, they, all the people that wanted to kill him. He delivered them from slavery. He took them on Mount Sinai. They saw and heard from God. That they literally, the Shekinah glory cloud is hovering over this mountain with fire and lightning and thunder and, and the people were so afraid to hear from God because he was, they knew how terrifying and powerful God was. They said, please God, just speak to Moses and he can tell us. So God spoke to Moses. 
And now here they're going. They're two weeks away from going into the promised land. Now they're not because they've already walked those two weeks. They're just outside of the promised land. And God says, go take that land. Well, let's go spy it out because we're not sure yet. I don't know. I mean, there could be, well, they say, there's giants in the land. But I want you to look at the, the fear. The eyes of fear focus on the negative. Numbers chapter 13, verse 27 28. It says, And they told him, We come to the land which you sent us. It flows with milk and honey, and its fruit, however, the pe- or, and, it, and, it, and, uh, and this is its fruit. However, but, however, the people who dwell in the land are strong, and the cities are fortified and very large. And besides that, we saw the descendants of Anak there. Yes, the land's flowing with milk and honey, but God, yeah, it's, it's everything you promised, but God, there's people there already. The people are strong. The cities are large and they're fortified. How often do we keep from doing something great for God because we're so focused on the negative? I can't teach that class. I mean, no one will listen to me. I can't serve in Awana. Kids don't like me. I can't go to the mission field. I mean, there might be danger in the mission field. Have you read anything about the Giaz family and what they're going through in Africa? I mean, they they had a whole government change there because a coup came in and took over the government. But you know what? I've talked to them. They said, God's called us here. We're not leaving unless they force us out. But it's so scary. Yeah, but my God's way bigger than any country and any nation. And my God's bigger than any problem that we might have. And He's bigger than any money problem that I might have. And He can solve all of it. He's God. The church isn't like it used to be. I mean, it's just not like it used to be. Whatever your excuse, stop it. I don't want to serve in that ministry because it's not very organized. Well, maybe God wants you in that ministry because you are organized. Maybe God wants you to get involved because He wants to show you what He can do through you. Last week, Jordan Dye came in my office and asked me if they could make coffee and have donuts this morning. I was like, awesome. What do I got to do? Nothing. Awesomer. (laughs) How many of you ate donuts this morning? They were pretty good, weren't they? Instead of focusing on how difficult it would be or the complaints that will certainly come, they saw an area that would make the church a little better experience and they took it on. They didn't say, Pastor, you should do this and Pastor, you should do that and Pastor, you should do this. They said, we'll take it. See, eyes of fear are always looking at the negative. Eyes of fear always concerns itself with other people. I mean, they said in verse 29, it says, The Amalekites dwell in the land of Negev, and the Hittites, and the Jebusites, and the Amorites, and the Stalactites, and everybody else, whoever you want to say there. There can't be enough. I know the land's flowing with milk and honey, but there can't be enough for all of us. One of the things that we're always worried about when we walk in fear rather than faith is what other people think of what we're doing. Yes, the land is full of milk and honey, but all those people there, there won't be any left for us. They're bigger than we are. They're better armed than we are. We can't win. In verse verse 33, it says they, they see us like grasshoppers. I was reading I was reading ahead in Joshua. Joshua sent two spies out when they actually go into 40 years from this time, when they actually go in. And Joshua sent the two spies and they go see Rahab. And you know what she tells them? 
all of the people here are scared to death of you because they know that God gave you this city. They didn't think that they were, they didn't think Israel wasn't coming to take the land. They thought, we're scared to death because we know their God's on their side. We know He parted the Red Sea for them. They walked across. He destroyed the strongest army in the world at the time, the world empire of Egypt. He destroyed the biggest army in the world right there, and they didn't have anything. What are they going to do to us? That's what they thought. They didn't think they were small. They didn't think they were like grasshoppers. When I was a kid, I was wrestling in my first Junior Olympics. And I made it to the finals in the Junior Olympics. And I remember, it, like, it was, it was a big event, but it just, it, it would just went by so fast. I didn't have time to think about anything. It was like, you know, they call your name, you walk over to the table, the other kid that you're wrestling walks over to the table, you walk out on the mat, and you wrestle. And I was fine. All, all day it was like, you know, it was Friday night and then Saturday and you go all day. But then they sent you home and you come back for the finals and they do this parade of champions. And so you come back and you all go down. They take you down into this locker room and you're all sitting there. And I, I see this kid that I'm wrestling. I didn't know who he was. I never, never met him before. But I was like, I start like all these people were coming telling me, Oh man, this kid's so good, and he's this, and he was the defending state champion, and he's this, and he's that, and all. And all of a sudden, I'm thinking about this kid, and I'm worried to death. Like, what is it? He must be a monster. I mean, he's gonna kill me. I, I don't know what I'm gonna do. And I, my dad could see that I was that I was struggling with this. My dad came over and he kind of grabbed me and he said, he said, "Son, how much does that kid weigh?" I said, "Well, he weighs the same as me." He said, "How do you suppose he puts his pants on?" I said, "I don't know." He said, probably the same way you do. He said, you know what sport he's, he's really good at? I said, wrestling. He said, you know what sport you're really good at? He said, you know what the rules are for him in wrestling? I said, yeah, they're the same as for me. He said, you know, he's, he's learning the same moves that you do. He said, stop worrying about him. You do what you do. And it was like, I don't have to worry about this guy. I went out and beat the kid, won my first ever gold medal. I thought... Well, that worked pretty good. I wish it worked all the time. <laughs> but you know what? All the time, we're so worried about what everybody else thinks. We're, we, we can worry ourselves to death. Look how many people spend all of their time and their energy on Facebook making sure that their profile looks just right, that their hair is done just right, that they look as cool as they can because they're worried about what everybody else thinks about them. And they get consumed with so many things. How many times do we, do we not obey God because we're worried about some, what someone else might think about us? Or we're worried about, uh, uh, about are they better than we are? We worry that we're missing out on something. Because we're worried about what other people think, many people project this fake image that they think projects them in, a, in, in this great image and no one really cares. They spend time more, they spend more time working on their image than they spend living their life. See, you don't have to please everyone else. The truth is, the only person that we're called to please is an audience of one, and that's God. Am I serving God to the best of my ability? Am I honoring Him with my life? Am I doing what He wants me to do? But you know what? None of those 12 spies were worried about what God wanted. All they could see, they, all they could see was the fear. Oh, there's giants in the land. Oh, there's these people over here. Oh, we can't do that. Oh, we can't take this. There's not enough food for all of us. They were worried about everything. All they did were, was get consumed by their fear. That's what fear does. See, you don't have to please everyone else. You just have to ask yourself, what does God think of how I'm doing, how I'm living? The third thing I want us to see about fear is the eyes of fear underestimate what God can do through you. Numbers chapter 13, verses 31 to 33, it says, The men who had gone up with him said, We're not able to, stand, we're not able to go up against this people for they are stronger than we are. So they brought the people of Israel a bad report in the land they had spied out, saying, the land through which we have gone to spy out, it's a land that devours its inhabitants. And all, all the people that we saw are in it are of great height. 
And there we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak. Nephilim just means giant. Who came from the Nephilim. And we seem, we seem to ourselves like grasshoppers. And so we seem to them. We can't beat them. They're giants. Let me ask you something. If God be for us, who can be against us? Do you know what a majority is? One plus God is a majority over anything else. Over anything else. Eyes of fear can never see what God wants to use them to do because they always run away so that God can't use them. Remember Peter? He's in the boat and Jesus is walking on the water. And he says, Peter, come to me. And Peter gets out of the boat and he's going to God. He's walking on the water. He's walking to Jesus. But then all of a sudden, he realizes, man, there's waves all around me and I'm going to sink. And he takes his eyes off of Jesus. And what happens? Boop, right in the water. That's what fear does. Fear takes its eyes off of Jesus. Peter, while he was looking at Jesus, he could walk on water. While his faith was focused on the one who he had put all his faith in, he, would, he could walk on water. I wouldn't have got out of the boat. But Peter had his eyes on Christ. He wasn't worried about the giants. I'm going to tell you something. Joshua and Caleb, they're like, yeah, those guys are so big. We shoot our arrows. We can't even miss. They're so big. The other guys are going, oh, they're so big. They're going to kill us. See, the waves are all, and the waves are all the distractions that make us take our eyes off of Jesus. They even said how the other people saw them. How did they know how they saw them? They didn't. They didn't know what anybody thought of them. They just knew what they were afraid of. And the eyes of fear always underestimate what God wants to do through you. See, fear always tells you you can't. God always says, you can. I can do all, I can do some things through Christ who strengthens me. Is that what it says? I can do all. You know what all means? All means all, and that's all all means. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. But do you know how many people, do you know how few people walk that walk of faith where they go, Oh, it's hard. Oh, I'm distracted. Oh, this is going to be terrible. And they run away. And they never serve God. They never, God never accomplishes anything through them because they're always afraid. Because fear always underestimates what God wants to do. The fourth thing I want you to see about fear. Fear always infects other people. Look at, what it's, look at what it says here in verses 14, verses 1 through 4. So here are these 10 guys come back with a bad report. Look at what the people do. It says, Then all the congregation raised a loud cry, and the people wept that night, and all the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The whole congregation said to them, would that we had died in, in the land of Egypt? Or would, we, would that we had died in this wilderness? Why is the Lord bringing us into this land? God can't do what He said He can do. To fall by the sword, our wives and our little ones will become a prey. Would it not be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to one another, let us choose a leader and go back to Egypt. 
do you remember what we read last week? Moses last week and Aaron and his, sis and his sister came after Moses and they, they, they wanted to put Moses out and they wanted to be the leaders. Miriam got leprosy and God spoke to them at the place of meeting. Apparently they didn't learn. Because God's going to speak not only to them at the place of meeting, He's going to speak to all of them at the place of meeting later in this chapter. The fear of these ten guys sent the entire camp into a panic. They want to overthrow Moses, pick a new leader, and go beg to be put back into slavery. Geniuses. Do you know that the Bible teaches that there are two sins that are to be handled publicly in church discipline? That sexual sin of leadership that's known. And it's people causing division, gossip, and slander. When we sow discord, it divides. Why, why does God want us to deal with those sins directly? Because it affects so many people. Because when people are afraid, they panic and they'll go right back to slavery. But now I want to show you what it looks like to see things through the eyes of faith. See, Joshua and Caleb, they went to the same land with the same guys, saw the same things. And they came back with a completely different story. Joshua and Caleb believed God's promise. But Caleb, uh, verse, uh, chapter 13, verse 30, it says, But Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and occupy it, for we're able to overcome it. Don't you remember what God delivered us from? Don't you remember the slavery we were, we were in? And how Pharaoh said, we're not going to let them go. And God did those ten plagues. And we walked out of there. And then they came after us. And God parted the Red Sea. And we walked across on dry land. And God consumed their armies. What are you guys, stupid? Let's go right now. God said it's ours. I would imagine he remembered walking across the sea on dry land. He wasn't focused on the negative. If God be for us, who can be against us? If God brought us this far, isn't he going to take us the rest of the way? I mean, here we are, we're standing on the precipice of going and receiving the promise that God gave us. I can't go. I would imagine he remembered the Egyptian army being swallowed by the sea. But he wasn't focused on other people. He didn't care what those people looked like in the land. He didn't care how big they were because through his eyes, God was bigger than all of that. I would imagine that he remembered the power of God that was displayed on Mount Sinai and how, how that terrifying God is going before us. We got the Ark of the Covenant, the Shekinah glory cloud. We're going to go in and take this land because if God be for us, who can be against us? He wasn't underestimating what God could do if they just simply obey. Look at Joshua chapter 14, verses 6 through 10. It says, And Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, who were among those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes. And they said to all the congregation of the people of Israel, this land which we passed through to spy it out, it's exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, He will bring us into the land and He'll give it to us. A land that flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord and do not fear the people of the land for they are bread for, they are bred for us. Their protection is removed from them. And the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. Look at what the congregation did. Then all the congregation said to stone them with stones. 
But the glory of the Lord appeared at the tent of meeting to who? All the people of Israel. Remember last week I told you if I was if I was Aaron and I was Miriam, I'd be shaking in my boots having to go to the tent of meeting. And now it's all of Israel. I want you to understand something. When we look at things through the eyes of faith, there's hope. When we see through the see things through the eyes of faith, it's simple. Obey. You say, but I don't understand. But it's hard. Yeah, it is sometimes. We're, I, I taught youth this morning, and and we were talking about how important it is that we love people and how hard it is sometimes. But when we love people, it costs something. If we ever do anything that's worth anything, it costs. And the greater the cost, the more value it is. I was talking to Josh this week and and sharing with him some things that I'm learning. And I shared with him that as I I go through this book of Numbers, that I've been going through this book of Numbers and it's becoming evident to me that God, that kind of the theme that I just, that keeps pressing on me is we've got to be all in. I mean, you, you look at these people in the book of Numbers and they, since they left Egypt, none of them were all in. They were like, oh, I got one foot in. I like Moses when, you do, when, when things are going well, but man, if it goes bad, you stink, Moses. You got to get out of here. They, they like one foot in when they're crossing the Red Sea, but then when they get across and they're hungry, they go, oh, Moses, you took us out here and now we're starving to death. We got nothing. God can't do anything with people with one foot in. He wants us all in. He doesn't want people chasing after this and uh, with one foot and, and the wor- coming, at, uh, coming to church with one foot and then the world with the other foot. He doesn't want people of convenience. He want, wants people who are committed. Josh shared with me, he said, I've been learning something similar to that. He said, here's what he said. He said, I've been learning a lot lately, especially about my purpose in life and every Christian's purpose to live in light of God's kingdom and my role in it. Because life is not about me, but Him. His glory and His kingdom. He said, I think that's where the disconnect is for people. It's the daily battle, moment by moment, Living life for myself rather than living it for Him. See, we go through this world and we think it's all about me. It's all about what I want and it's all about what I can do. It's all about me. And everything's here just to serve me. And the truth of the matter is it's all about Him. And everything that I do in this life, the only things that are going to matter are what's done for Him. There are times when I don't understand. I don't understand why God called Josh and Becky away. And I don't understand that. And it's hard. It's It's a struggle that I have. It hurts when some of our military families leave and they're so tied in the church and they're committed and they're connected. And I'm certain that it didn't make sense to Moses why the people complained all the time. But here's what we need to know. It's not about me. This church is not Chris's church. The people in this church are not my people. We are his people. And this is his church. And all I am is his servant. God is faithful. And I know that God, sometimes we don't understand. And the children of Israel got that. They didn't understand. God, why are we eating manna? Well, because it's sustenance. You're in the desert. You're two weeks away from going into the promised land. But just hang on. Your kids ever come to me? Daddy, daddy, daddy. And you're like, just hang on. We're getting there. Here's the rest of this story. 
God judges Israel. Declare he was going to kill them all. And Moses interceded. Good old Moses. You talk about a great leader. Moses interceded. So God says, all right, Israel. Anyone that's over 20 years old, you can't go in the promised land. In this desert that you hate so much, and this wilderness that you're in, you're going to roam around for 40 years in there until all of you are dead. And then everybody that's under 20 is going to go into the promised land. And what do you think they did? Oh God, you're so good. They complained. You know what else they did? They said, okay, God, we're sorry. We're, we're, gonna, we're sorry. We're going to follow you now. We're going to obey you. Moses, we're going into the promised land tomorrow. Moses says, you can't go in there tomorrow. God just punished you. God just said no. And he said, you can go in there, but God's not going with you. The ark's not going with you. You're going to go in there and die. Because without God, you can't do this. But with God, we can do it all. Well, Moses, we don't like you anyway. We're going. Guess what? Everyone that went got slaughtered. The next day. You talk about a bad week. So here's my question for you this morning. Are you seeing your future and making decisions on your future with the eyes of faith? Or do you make your decisions with eyes of fear? The Bible says without faith, it's difficult to please God. Is that what it says? Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Faith starts with believing what God said about salvation. That it only comes through a relationship with Jesus Christ. Listen, you can't, you can't see anything else with faith until you take that first step of faith by trusting Christ. But maybe you're here and you're a Christian and you find yourself living like the ten spies and like Peter and all you see are the waves around you and everything you see is through eyes of fear and not through eyes of faith. Can I tell you something? It's sin. It's sin. Not because Chris says it's sin. God says, I've not given you a spirit of fear, but of power and love and of a sound mind. And every time we look at things with the eyes of fear, we're believing the lies of the enemy. And I don't want to believe the lies of the enemy. I want to trust and obey and see what God can do. So my question for you this morning is, are you looking at things through the eyes of fear? Or are you looking at things through the eyes of faith? I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. Look, it's 11 o'clock. I'm finishing right on time. Listen. It's so easy to fall into this trap. I mean, you look at our world with COVID and everything, and, and there, I, I met a lady this week that their church still isn't meeting. And it's so easy to get caught up in believing all this stuff and living in fear. You know why we didn't close the church? Because the Bible says, Forsake not the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, and so much more as you see the day approaching. And I'm not saying it's for I'm not saying it's for everybody. Listen, I understand there's legitimate concerns that people have illnesses and things like that. But I want to tell you something. I believe God. 
And we could stand here and, and make every reason in the world why we're afraid or why we think this or why we're looking at negative things. And, and we can be negative about everything or we can start trusting God and saying, okay, God, I'm going to trust you. Not only am I going to trust you with my, with my words, I'm not just going to say that I trust you. I'm going to trust you with my actions. I'm going to follow you and obey you. And yes, it's scary at times to obey you. It's scary at times to walk the walk of faith. Until I look at it through the eyes of faith and look at the God that I serve and say, Lord, it's not about me. It's about you. And I will trust you. Though you slay me, still I'll obey. Still I'll follow. Listen, I don't know where you're at this morning. I don't know if you're looking at things through fear. I don't know what you're looking at things through. But if it's not through faith, you need to look at it again and say, Lord, I trust you. The altar's open this morning. It's not for anybody to judge you. It's for us to come alongside of you. It's amazing when people start living by faith how God moves. Let's stand for prayer. Father, we come before you today. Lord, we look at this passage of Scripture, Lord, this book that you've been just dealing with me about, Lord, and it's so easy to just not be all in. It's so easy to just float along and, and do what everybody else does, Lord, but God, you've asked us to be committed. Lord, you didn't ask us. You demand that we're committed. And Father, I pray, Lord, that each one of us, Lord, will search our heart and see, Lord, am I looking at things through the eyes of fear or am I looking at things through the eyes of faith? So, Lord, I pray that you'll bless this invitation, that you'll have your will and your way. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.